So today is our Dahabon Sunday, as we've labeled it. It is the day where we are going to be introducing the work, um, or, or at least formally introducing the work that we've been doing in Dahabon, or I should say that the Lord has started in Dahabon. Um, this is a little interesting. I've never done a PowerPoint presentation at church. I'm used to uh, just simply teaching the Bible. <laughs> it's going to be a, a different way of going about it today. But I'd like to start off in the Bible, if you will, and turn with me to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, chapter 7. And I'm going to read verses 9 through 14. It says this, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on a throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne, and around the elders, and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne, and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these clothed in white robes and from where have they come? I said to him, sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So when, usually when we talk about missions uh, and we think of Bible verses or passages in the Bible that speak about missions, we tend to think of um, the commands to go and evangelize, right? Like usually the first passage that pops up is Matthew 28, right? The Great Commission passage um, where we, we go into all the world and we make disciples, right? Um, um, lately, and, uh, and by God's grace, um, I hope you, you are all growing in this as well. I don't want you to only think about the commands to go and evangelize or, or the, the process of evangelism, the process of missions, the process of church planting. I want to encourage you to think of the goal, the goal of it. Um, there's an end to missions. Missions isn't the end to all of this. Missions is a means to a great end. Um, and the, that great end is Christ receiving the reward for his suffering. It's him receiving worship from the innumerable multitude. Um, him receiving all that the Father has given to him. And in this text here, we see a little piece of that. Every tribe, tongue, and nation, an innumerable multitude, you can't count them. Just like Abraham looked at the stars in the sky, God told him to try to count them, and he could not count them. Just like all of the grains of sand, you can't count them. And so it is, so it is with the worship of the Son for eternity. Amen. So I want you to think, I want you to think in those terms when we think of missions, when we think of Dahabon. When you look at um, our work in Dahabon, I want you to think of um, what is this going to mean in the end for the Lord Jesus Christ? What is this going to mean for his glory? Um, what a privilege it is to be involved in a little swath, a little swath of that great multitude who will worship him for eternity. So um, some of you here are new. Um, so I'm just throwing out words. I mentioned this town called Lebanon. Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. So 
Um, to introduce things, uh, we are working on planting a church in an obscure little town on the border between the Dominican Republic and Haiti, um, and this town is called Dahabon. It's a very small town, but there's, it's, a quite, it's, it's a very dense town as well. It's, a, it's an official border town. There's a border crossing at this town. Um, there's a population of Dominicans and a population of Haitians in this town. There's lots of languages being spoken <laughs> in this town. And uh, in the last three years, we've had the opportunity um, to work in and around this town um, uh, for the gospel, for the sake of Christ. And, I want, and what I'm going to do today is I want to start from the beginning, if you will, and tell you a story. And the, the point of me telling you this story is to give you a picture of how God has been working in this place um, for some time. And I want, I want you, in the end, to be excited for the work that is going on in Dahabon. So this started, and I'm, and I'm gonna be a little confused here. This is, again, it's my first time doing this. Uh, um, this all started in Haiti. This all started in Haiti. Um, there's a number of Haitian, we have a Haitian population in our church. And there's a number of brothers and sisters who have been praying for the opportunity to do gospel work in Haiti and to see Haitians saved. Um, and um, through prayer, um, through the opportunity of a hurricane hitting Haiti and a number of events, um, um, some brothers, uh, namely Oliver and Wes, they ended up getting to know, uh-oh, a brother in Wanameth, Haiti, named Tony Hippolyte. Tony Hippolyte, and a brother on this side of, uh, in the United States, actually in Titusville, named Bob Swan. Tony, Tony is the guy in the blue shirt right there in the middle. I know it's a little hard to see him with the lighting. Tony, Tony is a pastor of a church. Um, in English, it's called um, Grace Baptist Church in, in Haiti. And we've made a number of trips to assist Tony. Uh, a number of trips, a number of exploratory trips, some evangelistic trips to assist Tony. And um, during that period of time of making trips, we had, we had a visit here. I don't know if some of you probably remember this visit from Bob Swan. And Bob Swan introduced to us what the, the spiritual conditions look like in Haiti. And what he described was a very dire situation. Um, you have a country where the gospel is largely um, unpreached. Um, uh, Haiti, people say Haiti is uh, 90 percent Catholic and 100 percent voodoo. Um, there's, very, there's, very little, there's very little gospel being preached in Haiti. On top of that, um, Haitians don't have a, a good Bible, a good whole Bible. They have a Bible, but it's very poorly translated. Um, and there is a good translation of the New Testament that we found, but that's it. Imagine only having the New Testament. Um, how dire of a situation that would be. Um, so when Bob came and he spoke about that, um, I was very, I was very, um, I wanted to help personally. And um, at the time I was thinking about ministry and I wanted to see what, what would it take to try to plant the church in Haiti and to try to work in Haiti. So I started coming along on the trips that the brothers were making to Haiti. But in time, we figured out that Haiti just wasn't going to work. Uh, the safety situation in Haiti is not good, especially for an American. Um, there's a lot of government corruption. There's just a general lack of stability in Haiti. Um, even on one of our trips, uh, we, had, we uh, almost got delayed in coming back due to um, a riot that happened in the city where our, our flight was flying out. There's many beautiful things about Haiti, very many kind people in Haiti, um, but it's, it's not a very stable place. It's not a very stable place to be. Um, so as we took trips, as we considered planting a church, 
um, it was becoming pretty clear that the door on Haiti was closing. So, um, so we, the, the question is, what's the plan? What's the plan? What's the plan at that point? Um, so through a number of meetings, uh, there was a dinner at Robinson's house. Um, there was lunch with Pastor Mark and Oliver, uh, where we came up um, with ideas, uh, with the idea to um, potentially plant a church in Dahabon. And you might say, well, why, why, why Dahabon in the Dominican Republic all of a sudden? Well, Pastor Tony's church is in a city called Wanamint. And Wanamint is a border town on the Haitian side. And directly across the border from Wanamint is Dahabon. So the closest that we can get to Wanamint, that was a safe and stable place. So after, after, um, off, after these meetings, after eating lunch, uh, we decided that we were going to contact some Dominican pastors who we assumed probably worked in Haiti. So the first thought in our mind was let's, let's contact Suhel Michelin. Some of you Spanish-speaking brothers are familiar with that name, Suhel Michelin. He's kind of like the, from what is described to me, he's like the Latino uh, John MacArthur. <laughs> So we picked the most popular name we could. And when you, pick, when you want to talk to someone popular, you find someone who knows popular people. And there's someone here that's very good at knowing popular people. Some of you know who I'm talking about. It's Edgar Nazario. <laughs> so, so after eating lunch with Pastor Mark and Oliver, um, I give Edgar a call. And I say, hey, Edgar, um, we need to get in contact with Suhel Michelin. Um, I, I, I think you know him. <laughs> uh, so, and you know what Edgar says? Oh, sure. I just had lunch with him. <laughs> it turns out um, that while we were eating lunch, Edgar was having lunch with Suhel Michelin because Suhel Michelin was um, in town for the Ligonier Conference, and guess who was translating for him? Okay. Edgar, Edgar. Yeah, there's a video on YouTube you should check out with Edgar uh, translating for Suhel Michelin. So Edgar um, gets in contact with Suhel, and um, Suhel is with another pastor from his church um, uh, named Salvador Gomez. Um, both, of these, both of these men, their church is um, Ibe Esejota. In English, um, it's IBSJ. Um, their church in English would be uh, the Lord Jesus Bible Church. Um, so they, um, they gave us two contacts. They gave us uh, the name of a man named Angel Castillo, and they gave us Francisco Guzman. Um, but before I called either of those guys, I came to church one day, and there's another gentleman who was at our church at the time, Edwin Guerra. And Edwin, Edwin was very excited, and he was talking to me about his friend that he knew from the Dominican Republic, because Edwin is Dominican, he had just moved here uh, from the Dominican Republic. And he went to Suhel's church. So he said, you have to meet my friend Jean-Pierre. Jean-Pierre, this guy is a Haitian. Um, he works in Haiti. He does a lot of mission work in Haiti. I'm going to give you his contact info. I'm like, sure, I'll take any contact info you got, Edwin. So I get that contact info. And then, um, so the first person I contact actually isn't, aren't the contacts that Suhel gave me. I contacted the guy that Edwin gave me, just because Edwin was so aggressive. <laughs> so we met. Jean-Pierre, um, and Jean-Pierre is the Haitian in this picture. Can you pick out the Haitian? <laughs> yes, yes, the bald guy in the middle is the Haitian. <laughs> um, Jean-Pierre is a Haitian. Jean-Pierre uh, was born in Port-au-Prince, and uh, he grew up in Haiti, 
Um, he, uh, he's obviously not Haitian um, by ethnicity, but he considers himself a Haitian. And when he talks about Haitians, he affectionately says we instead of they. <laughs> um, so he's not, Jean-Pierre is a very um, cultured man too. He speaks four languages. He speaks Haitian Creole, French, Spanish, and English. Um, he went to college in the United States, um, and he's also a very, very sweet brother. Uh, um, so, um, so I, I got I got in contact through WhatsApp uh, of Jean Pierre, and I also contacted those two contacts that. Um, Suhel Michelin and Salvador Gomez gave us uh, Angel Castillo and Francisco Guzman. Angel Castillo didn't answer the phone, <laughs> so, but Francisco Guzman did. And when I talked to Francisco Guzman, it was, uh, it was not easy because he didn't speak much English and I didn't speak any Spanish. <laughs> so um, as I was talking to Francisco, I, uh, I said, by any chance, because I, I thought he went to Suha Michelin's church. That's why he, you know, Suha gave me his number. And so I said, do you know Jean-Pierre? He says, oh, yes. Picture I have of him, uh, of Francisco Guzman. Um, he's a dear brother. So we ended up taking a trip to the Dominican Republic, uh, me and Oliver. Um, half of the trip was to have some disciple time, discipleship time with uh, Tony Hippolyte, the Haitian pastor. He uh, drove over to Santiago to meet us. Um, but then the second half of the trip, uh, we were going to go down to Santo Domingo to meet uh, Pastor Guzman, Francisco Guzman, and Jean-Pierre. And Jean-Pierre was going to translate for us. Um, so uh, we meet, we meet Jean-Pierre, uh, we pick him up from his house, and he, like I said, he is, he is just the sweetest brother that you would ever meet. He comes in with a big, like a big manila folder. I was even wondering how he fit all those things in a manila folder. It's like everything was going to fall out. It's full of resources, um, full of things to talk through. He was very excited. Also, uh, 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 and then and we drove, and he, we were talking about this all on the way to uh, uh, Pastor Guzman's house. Um, so we get to Pastor Guzman's house, and they welcome us in. His wife, Clara, fixes us a really nice meal, and we spend a long time meeting with him. And Pastor Guzman, he gives us some really good advice. Uh, so we asked him about our plans in Haiti. And uh, we were already having second thoughts about Haiti. And he, he looked me in the eye, and he's like, brother, don't go to Haiti. <laughs> um, uh, he, he, um, he was telling us of his uh, pastor's academy and how that would be a great, uh, great thing for Tony to be trained up in, which was something that we were looking for for him. And we also... We also uh, brought up our idea about Dahabon, uh, and he said, um, he said, this idea about Dahabon, this is an excellent idea. Um, but this is the kicker. You see, Dahabon is a very, like I said before, it's an obscure little town. Some Dominicans don't know where Dahabon is. Um, and he, uh, he mentioned that they had been praying for over 20 years for a church in Dahabon. And um, his wife is from Dahabon. And his brother-in-law lives in Dahabon. And um, uh, what, uh, um, what an event of God's providence, isn't it? So um, it, it's, it, it would almost be as if someone, uh, someone here were from Crestview, Florida, five, six hours away. Uh, let's say Karen Brashear, Pastor Mark's wife, is, was from Crestview, Florida. And she had been praying for a church to be planted in Crestview, a little obscure city. Most of you don't know of Crestview, Florida. You've never heard of Crestview, Florida. You've driven through it, maybe. <laughs> 
Um, and after, after praying for many, many years and having family there, someone seemingly out of the blue comes to you with a real intention to plant the church. Someone from a like-minded church, confessional like yours, reformed like yours, <laughs> Um, uh, it's, a, it's a clear answer to prayer. So um, we, were, we were extremely, extremely encouraged. <clears throat> In fact, we were encouraged that Pastor Guzman was positive about anything. Because the first time that, when you meet Pastor Guzman for the first time, he's a very stoic, stoic looking man. Um, we, we, we made jokes behind his back that he's, he's like a mafia don. <laughs> Just a very, doesn't change his facial expressions much. He sits back in his chair, very measured speech. Um, so there's like a real intimidation factor when you, when you meet him for the first time. Um, so we ended, up, we ended up coming home very encouraged. I was extremely excited uh, to come to the elders meeting and to report at how well things have gone um, in, with our meeting with Pastor Guzman. And my next plan was, well, what are we going to, I'm going to take my wife to Dahabon. I'm going to take her and I'm going to show her. You know, I'm going to show her this city. So I bought plane tickets. I, um, I, I, I reserved the hotel room. I uh, reserved the rental car. I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Um, not, not much later, uh, literally a week or two later, Pastor Guzman sends me a text and tells me that uh, he is going to be in Coconut Creek, Florida, right outside of Miami, down south, uh, because he was meet he's meeting Jeff Smith and Dan Wakefield and Victor Garcia about a church plant that he's working on in Honduras. Um, they actually just sent one of their pastors, Dante Paz, to, to uh, Honduras, Huticalpa. And he, um, so he said, yeah, maybe we can meet. And it was a great opportunity for our elders to meet him. So we went down to Coconut Creek, Florida. Um, we brought uh, um, Pastor Mark. And um, Pastor Mark got the chance to uh, meet Pastor Guzman. Pastor Mark kissed his ring. No, no, no. <laughs> no, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Mark only kisses Miss Karen. <laughs> so, um, but we met uh, we met Pastor Guzman, and um, and you know, and we started talking about what it would look like to plant the church in Dahabon. And um, I mentioned to Pastor Guzman, "Hey, I'm really excited." I'm, I'm actually going to bring my wife during, on 4th of July weekend, you know, to Dahabon. And at that time, we had went earlier in May, you know, so we're talking within, you know, within a month and a half-ish, two months, something like that. And I'm messing up my times. Yeah, a month, a month's time. Went the end of May to early July. So we... Uh, um, so when I tell Pastor Guzman I'm going to take my wife to Dahabon that weekend, he says... Oh, I'm going to Dahabon too. <laughs> I'm like, oh, really? So uh, the next thing you know, I'm, uh, I cancel my hotel reservation. I cancel my rental car. My wife and I are flying to the Dominican Republic on 4th of July weekend, and he's picking us up from the airport. <laughs> uh, and, and we spend... A, uh, a long weekend with uh, his, his in-laws, uh, his, his wife's family. Um, his wife, uh, Clara, she has a brother named Waskar. Um, that, those are, um, that lady down sitting at the left of that bench is Idalia, that's Waskar's wife, that's Kimberly in the middle there. Um, and uh, we, uh, uh, we spent a, a good weekend with them. Uh, and Pastor Guzman spent the whole time smoozing us. Um, this was us at the beach, and um, this um, here, I brought Anita to Haiti. We crossed the border. Um, we actually went and we talked to Pastor Tony, and um, we talked to him about the, going to, uh, attending the Pastor's Academy. So 
Um, we were very encouraged on both sides. Uh, Pastor Guzman, he spent the whole time saying, Jerome, this is your city. <laughs> Jerome, the president of the Habon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, um, um, so, um, and we were extremely encouraged. Um, we can see, um, we could see that there's, you know, there's no such thing as coincidence. There's no such thing as circumstance. And many of these things were coming together very well. So we saw it as the hand of the Lord on the work that we were, um, we were attempting to do. So we end up coming home and we get to planning. Uh, we end up taking a trip um, that November, November 2019, and for this, it was very difficult planning this trip because just because of the timing of it, we couldn't find anyone uh, from Cornerstone who was going to be able to come and help translate for us. And um, but Pastor Mark went to a pastors' conference in New Jersey. And he met a gentleman named Luke Peterson. And Luke Peterson, he pastored at the time a church in Costa Rica. Um, and Pastor Mark explained how, how, how good of a brother he was. I remember how Karen spoke of his wife at the time. And, um, and Luke actually accompanied us um, to, uh, to the Dominican Republic. Uh, some of you remember Luke. That's Luke on the left there. Uh, he, um, and I can, I tell you, Luke was a major, major encouragement. Um, Luke, he, um, being a pastor himself, um, knowing what it was like, what it's like to plant the church. He had done work in Nicaragua um, previously. He actually had to flee Nicaragua um, due to danger for some time. He knew many of the pitfalls to avoid. Um, and he also knew the troubles of having to learn a language later in life. Um, so the brother was filled with encouragements. He was filled with advice. Um, uh, at times, I would doubt um, of the, you know, whether this was a good idea or not, and Luke was able to chime in with wisdom uh, much of the time. It was a great time. Uh, it was very, it was also very odd, too, because I met Luke on the way to the airport, <laughs> picking him up from Edgar's house. <laughs> um, but it was, it was almost like we knew each other for 20 years um, on the trip. Also encouraging was Wowo, Ron Kazmir. Um, Ron is one of the, the most faithful, positive thinking brothers that I know. Um, he, um, he was um, a, a good servant and good companion on the trip. And I'm very grateful to um, uh, Ron for um, the encouragement on that trip. That trip was a very important one for me. Um, to, to want to continue in this work. Um, and on that trip, we ended, uh, ended up preaching the gospel. This is a picture of us. This is a picture of the folks that um, I preached to in the countryside, right outside of Dahabon. Um, some of Clara's family lived there. Um, I actually preached that sermon in Spanish. It was horrible, <laughs> absolutely horrible. Um, it was very bad Spanish. I used, I used many wrong words, um, some Catholic words. Um, <laughs> Pastor Guzman had to correct me. He was, he was very encouraging and um, at the same time, uh, very clear. He sat down next to me in Wascar's house and he said, Jerome, never use rezar, only orar. In Spanish, rezar is like a rosary prayer. And I use that th throughout the whole sermon <laughs> instead of orar, which is a normal prayer. <laughs> um, so, um, and since my Spanish was so bad, Clara, she sat down, and this is Clara helping me <laughs> with my Spanish, very sweet. <laughs> uh, she is very precious. <laughs> um, so, from that trip, um, we understood our need to um, to seek and um, to seek a, a home base, if you will, in Dahabon. We needed a, a church house, 
um, from which we can uh, send people to go, from which pe to send people to do evangelism there, from both uh, Pastor Guzman's church and from our church. And, um, uh, and by God's grace, in about a month's time, we, we started getting uh, prospects for uh, houses that we could potentially rent. Um, and we ended up planning a trip uh, for February 2020. Uh, and, so, and on that February trip, uh, I went with Pastor Mark and Oliver, also two extremely encouraging brothers. Um, uh, uh, Pastor Mark and Oliver, uh, uh, some of the best companions you can ask for. Um, it, was, it was encouraging. It's always encouraging to have brothers that you've labored with in the past um, to labor in something new especially something that's a bit scary. And these brothers um, have always been very encouraging. Um, this is a picture here of uh, Clara uh, evangelizing at, outside of one of the homes in Dahabon, who were following her around as she did that. Um, she is extremely excited. One of my favorite memories of all of these trips is just following around Clara while she knocks on doors and introduces herself. She tries to get people to remember her. Um, and if they don't remember her, she makes sure they remember her father. <laughs> and, um, and she invites them to um, the services that we held um, some of the nights while we were there. And when, when we did uh, evangelize, like when we did go door to door evangelizing, we would go the same day we would invite people to our services that night, and people would come. Imagine that. Imagine, I mean, we would, we would love it if we evangelized on a Saturday and a bunch of the people came the next, you know, the next day on a Sunday. We would, there, were, there were a few times where we would talk to people about half an hour before, and they'd come. They'd come to our service a little bit late, but you can't blame them, half an hour. So... Also, we finalized papers on our little church house, and that's the house that we're renting right now. It's, um, it's in a perfect location. It's right across the street from a giant lime green um, store. Um, uh, and you don't even have to give out the address. Um, when, when I talk to people about it in Dahabon, I just tell them it's in front of the Almacen Rafaelito. And they know, they know exactly where I'm talking about. Um, um, so while there, on, on the February trip, we also got to preach the gospel at the house that we had just signed the papers on. Uh, I know some of those pictures are a little dark there. Um, but. Uh, that's me preaching and Jean-Pierre, he, he accompanied us on that trip as well and he's translating. Um, so we returned, we returned, and then the world changed, <laughs> like the next week. <laughs> um, uh, COVID-19 um, and uh, it, it, you know, it was, it was difficult because after that trip, we were actually planning on taking a bunch more trips that year. Um, uh, but um, we, everything had to take a halt. Um, we were obviously shut down here for some time by our government. Uh, the Dominican Republic was even more shut down. Uh, so, uh, but things started to open up, uh, especially um, as we neared summertime. And I, I had recently, or my wife had recently had a baby. We had Johnny, um, and John. Uh, and I, my job is very generous with paternity leave. I had a lot of paternity leave time um, that I had to use before Johnny's first birthday. So that that um, gave us a great opportunity to spend uh, a long period of time in the Dominican Republic. So. Um, what we did was I took my oldest daughter, Samantha, and we went to Santo Domingo, and we attended a Spanish language school um, in Santo Domingo. This is a picture of me trying to get everyone in focus, <laughs> um, and our teachers, uh, our, our Spanish teachers in Santo Domingo. 
Um, our Spanish improved quite a bit on that trip. During that trip, we spent the whole month in Santo Domingo. Uh, we attended Pastor Guzman's church during that time. Uh, spent a lot of time fellowshipping with him. Uh, we also took two trips to Dahabon um, in, in that time on the weekends. And um, I tell you the most encouraging part of that trip actually wasn't the Spanish though. It was the fact that we were able to um, gain confidence that we could live in the Dominican Republic because we were living in the Dominican Republic. We had an apartment, we had to go buy groceries, uh, we had to answer people's questions, um, you know, we had to assuage people who were getting angry with us, you know, here and there. So it was a good, it was a good trip. We had to drive all over the place. Uh, um, during the, the two trips to Dahabon, we also had a very good time. That top picture, probably a little hard to see. There's a lot of people. Um, there was a funeral. One of the ladies that stayed, um, uh, the, 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 the mother of the man that owns the church house that we, um, we rent, uh, she, she passed away. We actually met her in February. And we, we ended up going to Dahabon for her funeral uh, the first week that we were in the Dominican Republic. Um, it turned out to be a great opportunity. Uh, Pastor Guzman was able to preach a very beautiful gospel message, very simple, because even I could understand it. <laughs> um, and there were over 50 people there. Um, and uh, and they, were, they seemed to be listening very intently. Um, that gentleman to the bottom right um, that I'm, I'm standing next to is a guy named Frank Kelly. Um, Frank Kelly is a brother from Pastor Guzman's church, and he's one of the brothers that travels there um, almost every week now to, uh, to have hold Bible studies. And um, just a good, encouraging brother. Um, uh, it's a beautiful testimony of, of his conversion. And uh, Sammy also at the bottom left, that's Sammy on a motorcycle. Um, it's kind of, you can, you can, there's a lot of motorcycles there. And the age for driving a motorcycle is rather um, young. So that's uh, Sammy on a motorcycle and Waskar's 16 year old daughter uh, driving the motorcycle. I didn't let them go too far, but, uh, but she, uh, Sammy got a, a good chance to, to meet some Dominican kids, talk to the Dominican kids, play with them, um, especially in Dahabon, which is very nice. Um, so um, all in all, we were very, very thankful to be able to take that trip. We were also very homesick. <laughs> um, uh, we were very encouraging. Like, it, we were very encouraged, I should say. Like I said, um, it was, um, the, the biggest benefit was being able to live there for a time and to gain confidence that, oh yeah, I think we can, we can actually live here. We can, this can, we can make this work. Um, and also, like I said, the improved Spanish was also a boost. Uh, so what's going on right now in Dahabon? Well, there's Bible studies every week at the church house in Dahabon. Right now, right now, there are people gathering at the house and they are, um, they are being led in Bible studies by brother, brethren from Pastor Guzman's church. This is um, David Rosario um, teaching um, a Bible study lesson right outside. Sometimes they, they have the lesson outside because it's a little cooler. And um, sometimes they do that because the landlord uh, turns off the uh, electricity. <laughs> so we'll have to work with them <laughs> on that. So... Um, but yeah, they're having Bible studies every single week. There's a rotation of men. Uh, I previously said that there were 12 men who were going down there. Right now, it's three. There were 12 men before COVID hit that were lined up to go. Um, but right now, um, it's three, three brothers, and, but they are very faithful, very reliable. Um, having taught a Bible study with Frank Eli, who's one of those brothers, um, is very confident that uh, these these people are getting good Bible teaching um, um, every, every week. And they are very, very excited um, for the work. Um, every time I've attended Pastor Guzman's church, I'd have a number of these brothers um, coming to me, telling me how every single Wednesday night prayer meeting, they pray for the work in Dahabon. Um, they, they are 
full of excitement. They're full of, when are you going to move down, you know? <laughs> um, and um, um, it's very, very encouraging church, very encouraging brothers. Um, so the work continues today. The work continues today. And uh, I, want to, I want you to prayerfully consider how you can support the work. Um, there's many ways to support the work. Um, one way to support the work is to prayerfully consider moving down with us. Um, uh, perhaps if you're Spanish speaking, or even if you're not Spanish speaking, but you think that there's an opportunity for you to do that, please prayerfully consider doing that. Um, what a good use of your life to, to have it involved in gospel ministry. And what a great opportunity to go and to preach the gospel in a place where it is not preached. So I want you to be encouraged. Amen. <laughs> I want you to be encouraged. I want you to be encouraged um, to consider coming down. Prayerfully consider it. Get counsel, but encourage coming down. Um, also, I want to encourage you to hold the rope for us. That means support the work through your finances. Um, think uh, uh, there are many, many logistics that are involved in moving down there. Um, uh, there's, and some of that includes money. And I want you to consider how your gifts, how your offerings can be used to um, further the kingdom of God. Um, and, and by God's grace, uh, we have a pattern of doing that in this church. And I want to encourage you to continue that pattern and to see how you might be able to do that here in Dahabon. Lastly, um, I, I want you to consider, well, not lastly, second to lastly, I want you to consider <clears throat> taking frequent trips um, to see us in Dahabon. Uh, uh, there's, um, as some of you might know, um, in traveling to Guatemala or traveling to New York, the encouragement that comes when brothers from your sending church, your home church, uh, come um, to be with you, to evangelize and to encourage you, that's a big deal, a big deal. And I remember um, multiple times going up to see Pastor Rick and how encouraged he is when brethren come up from Cornerstone and how much of a boost that is to him. Um, I'm sure it would be a boost to us. So please consider how you might visit us even if you can't move visit us um, and encourage us in the work. And lastly, but definitely, definitely not least, um, consider how you may pray for us. Uh, and in your prayers, I want to direct your prayers in certain ways. So first, um, uh, I, I came up with four Ps. Four Ps. Like a, like a good Baptist. Uh, um, consider the purpose, pray for the purpose that Christ would be glorified, that he will receive the reward for his suffering, even in this obscure area, that um, people would be converted, and that a core group, um, that a core group would be formed. Um, and uh, pray for the pastor, that would be me, but not just the pastor, but his family, my family. Pray for my preparation in ministry, everything from theological preparation, um, to the Lord growing me in wisdom, um, to um, being able to acquire the Spanish language, um, and for my family to do that too, for my wife and for my kids to be able to adjust um, to, um, to the environment there and to the culture, and also for the process, all of the logistics involved in moving. It's enough of a chore, right, to move across town. <laughs> it's a big chore to move out of state, right? It's a huge chore to move to another country, especially when that other country is, over, is, is overseas or over AC, if you will. And so um, please pray that the Lord would guide our steps in all of the logistics and things of that sort. And for those of you who are interested in supporting us, I want to encourage you. Um, we have a giving website set up at missionsdahabon.org, um, and that is a site where you can, um, you can sign up to give on a regular basis to us um, and have those things automatically um, taken from your account. Uh, I, I, in the end, um, just like I started in the beginning, um, think, think of the potential 
um, for the gospel in Dahabon. Think of the potential that that has for eternity. Think of the glory that Christ receives um, for eternity, the innumerable multitude that will worship and praise him, um, uh, singing, crying out, uh, relishing in the fellowship that they have with the Lamb. Uh, um, that's what I want you to consider. Think of how this obscure town, um, a, yet a bustling town with a big market, <laughs> Um, and with much pass through, has so much opportunity to, um, for people to hear the gospel and for people to be, um, and for people to be saved. And I pray, I pray that the Lord will use our work in Dahabon for his glory. Um, so I don't have a whole lot of time for questions, but I want to open things up for questions. Yeah, Louis. Ah, yeah, thank you, brother. So let's bless your card. Yes. We have a table. If they can pick them up, um, fill it up, and put it on the offering plate. Yes, sir. Bring it to the membership banner. We want to see as soon as possible. Yeah. So, um, Lewis just reminded me we have we have these commitment cards here. And um, there's a table out front with these commitment cards on them. At some point today, we're going to pass these out. And um, this, is, this will be a perfect, we would like for you um, to, to fill this out. If you could, consider, or uh, um, and if you can't today, that's okay. But fill this out, and I want you to consider, consider how you might be able to give, what you might be able to commit to the work in Dahabon. Um, but, um, but again, I want to open it up for questions just for a few minutes. Any questions? Any questions about the work? Sergio. Hmm? When do I plan to leave? It's not much trying to kick you out. Yeah, I understand, man. Yeah, when, you wouldn't the, be the, the first. <laughs> what's the goal, like, in plans to, to live over there? Like, when you see yeah. yourself over there? Yeah, the, um, the goal would be um, to move January 2022, so a year from now. That's the goal. You know, that can change. It could be a little earlier. It could be a little later or much later. We don't know. But uh, that's, the, that's the stated goal. Any other questions? Ms. Leela. Um, Ms. Not Ms. Leela. Ms. Leah. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, what book are they studying? Um, what book are they studying? That's a good question. They have what um, is a discipleship manual that uh, Pastor Guzman has. What it is, it's sort of like a mix between a catechism and fill in the blank answers, you know? Um, so they, so it's not a particular book of the Bible, but they are going through um, basic Christian doctrine. So, um, and the flow is very similar to the flow that you'd see when you go through the catechism. Yeah. Barbie. Uh, I just wanted to comment on you as far as planning a trip for brothers and sisters to come and visit. Yes. Kind of like Guatemala had it where they have missionaries to come and share the gospel with people. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have something in mind like that? I guess for us to earn it because you guys have, you have not been yet. And Are you talking about the, the, um, to plan a trip there? Yeah. Like, like, yes. Absolutely. Yeah, our first trip this year will be the week of March 17th. March 17th. Um, spring break week um, is going to be the first trip this year. And it is open to everyone who would like to come. Thank you for asking. Very good question. <laughs> uh, Brianna. Um, are you guys going to be able to set up anything with Sermon Audio so we can listen to any preachings that you do or physically record it for us? Yeah, that would be the plan, um, especially since, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, assuming that the Lord continues to, to work things the way he's done, I would likely be the only, the elder there um, starting off. So um, both for encouragement um, for others who might listen and also for accountability, um, the plan is to record sermons and to put them on something like Sermon Audio. There's a question right here. Is it Nick? So this might not be relevant in a year from now, um, mm -hmm. but right now, you know, they have the Toca de Queda at um, mm -hmm. like a very small time that the churches are even allowed to be open on Sundays. Um, 
so it would just be, I guess, thinking about that, like what would be like, you know, the, the, the plan in case that's still extended because this COVID thing has been going on for, um, you know, quite a while. Yeah, Nick, Nick mentioned, Nick, Nick is refusing to speak English. <laughs> Nick mentioned toque de queda. Yes, that means that's the curfew. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm messing with you, Nick. Uh, that's the curfew in, in uh, Dominican Republic. And um, so the question is, uh, how is that going to affect how we continue working there? We'll just have to work around it, you know, and right now they, they're having curfew, but you know, it hasn't stopped by God's grace the guys from being able to travel down there. So um, um, we'll, we'll work around it. When Sammy and I went, it was under curfew um, for a while. So um, it's not pleasant by any means, <laughs> but we'll work through it. Thank you, brother. <laughs> Ms. How Gina. safe is it? Hmm? How safe? Dahabon is a very safe city. Um, there are there are, there is an element of crime uh, because it's a border town, but uh, not there's not a real big violent crime problem. Um, there's a there's like a drug trafficking crime problem, um, and it's usually relegated. The, the problems tend to surround those who get themselves involved in criminal activities. Um, but there's a very heavy police presence in Dahabon because of it being a border town. Uh, even the electricity, uh, unlike the rest of the Dominican Republic, even the electricity doesn't go out in Dahabon <laughs> um, because it's a border town and the police want to make sure that it's, um, it's always on. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Well, I think we're out of time anyway. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for this work um, that you have started and that you would have allowed, have allowed us to participate in. Um, Lord, I, I don't want to be a man that um, assumes anything about you or, and assumes anything about your ways or your plans. Um, at the same time, Lord, we have seen um, your hand work um, as we worked in Dahabon, and we see that it is a good and a wise thing for us to continue in this work. And we're very thankful, Lord, that you would give us this opportunity, this privilege. So, Lord, we, we ask you that you would continue the work, that people would be converted in Dahabon, that Jesus Christ would receive the reward for his suffering, that um, you would prepare me and prepare my family to go, and anyone else um, uh, who you would lay on their hearts to come with us. And Lord, we also pray that you would um, provide um, in all of the logistics, all of the guidance, all of the resources needed uh, for moving. Lord, we're very thankful to you. Um, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.